Hello and thank you for joining us on this week's edition of The Front Page. After a scintillating arc in a scorching Paris, we're going to spend the next half an hour diving deep into the cooling waters of analysis of what was a fantastic edition of Europe's Greatest Race. Joining me in the studio to discuss it and all the rest of the racing news, who else but John Harding. Hello John. Good morning, how are you? Very good. And yourself, did you have a trip to Paris this weekend? I did not, but I was glued to the screen, flicking between that and the Ryder Cup and the football. It was a bit of a headache, but great what sporting a, what a weekend. Sporting weekend yeah, right, no, as well. I mean, a, whatever your, your tipple is, golf, rugby, you, it had it all. Fantastic. Certainly did, and good results across the board. And joining us from Ireland, who else but DJ? How are you, DJ? How was your weekend? It was great, Tom. I wasn't in Longchamp, but I did enjoy the coverage. And as I said to you before the show, it's great when the best horse wins the best race in the best fashion. Uh, so I think we got all three of those things. Uh, terrific arc, terrific winner. And uh, yeah, plenty to talk about. Yeah, fantastic. And on that note, let's dive straight into the arc. It was billed as an unusually open edition of the race with perhaps no, well certainly no established superstar in the lineup. But what it did have is the unbeaten French Derby winner, Ace Impact, who'd been favorite for the race for a long time. And he duly showed his class, making a seismic impact as we have on the front page of the Racing Post today, uh, streaking away from his rivals to win by close to two lengths with a fantastic, fantastic display of acceleration. One of the most exciting and impressive arc victories in recent years. John, give us your assessment of the race. Where do you rank this one in the sort of recent pantheon of arc winners? I would say somewhere near Enable, probably one of Enable's first victory, I would suggest. Um, just visually incredibly impressive. The turn of foot he demonstrated, of course the ground would have helped in that regard, but it was a fantastic uh, acceleration in the closing stages there, right up there with the Enables, I think. We had a, a, an arc that wasn't run on bottomless ground. Class, therefore, came to the fore a little bit more. That pace came to the fore a little bit more, and Ace Impact was the best of them all. Yeah, so harking back to that 2017 uh, win at Chanty by Enable, which um, our RPR handicap has also agreed with. Um, That's a good they, sign. That is a good sign, absolutely. Uh, they put it as 129 RPR, 129, so equal to that 2017 uh, victory, Enable's uh, first at Chanty. Uh, and the last time it was exceeded Trev in 2013. So, so a really, really strong performance on the numbers and obviously visually, as you said, absolutely sensational. And I think Westover's the really helpful barometer here because of the older horses, he was him and Huckham really were the two, the King George 1-2 that set a very high standard among the older horses. I think Huckham's draw did him no favours, but mm. that's a separate issue. But Westover ran a massive race to finish second and for Ace Impact to accelerate away as he did uh, just gives you an idea of the horse he is and you know how high could the bar be. Yeah DJ I saw I saw one person comparing it to uh, Dancing Brave in the way in the way Ace Impact swept around the field what did you make of it? I thought he was a brilliant winner of a good arc uh, if that makes sense mm. like uh, Westover is, is look we all love Westover and I, I did a piece in the paper today just talking about west over and you know second and four group ones this season uh, including the king george and the arc shima classic coronation cup like it's been a terrific season but i think we all know that west is the type of horse that when there is a sta real star against him he won't win if does not he'll pick up the scraps um as he did when he won his group one this season in france but um as regards the winner, like I was on the, the podcast on Thursday for the Race and Post and I kind of stupidly said, I wonder are these three year olds actually any good? And maybe for that reason, Ace Impact is worth taking on because we don't actually know he's a superstar yet, but yet he's been priced as though he is a superstar. And then it's funny after the show between Friday and Saturday, I was talking to like people that I really respect and I'd say, text them, you know, what do you fancy in the arc? And they were like, well, shit, there's only one horse that can win the arc. It's, it's Ace Impact. And uh, as, cl as close, the closer the race got, the more I realised, God, this horse could actually be a star. Um, when you look through the form, Westover was second, as we said. Onesto, who's had a poor season, was third. Uh, True Seven Seas, who was given an awful lot to do, was fourth. Uh, I'd say she's, she's really, really good. And we saw that um, prior to uh, her run in France. Continuous, who didn't have his ground, didn't have his trip, was fifth. So... I would say it was a good arc. I'd say it was a brilliant winner. And to do what he did 
like when you looked at the race, you kind of said to yourself, Christian de Muro is probably sitting a bit too far back here. If you're on him, you were thinking, you know, he's got six or seven lengths to make up. They haven't gone very quick. Yes, they got going early enough, but they went very slow through the first half mile. And to be able to quicken in the manner he did means he must be an exceptional racehorse. So my summary of it, Tom, would be a brilliant winner of a good race. I think that's a, an interesting assessment. And, and certainly before the race, DJ, there were plenty of people sort of lining up to say this isn't the best crop of three-year-olds. Indeed, um, my um, uh, lost money on the race went on Plastic Carousel on the basis of Andre Fab himself saying uh, he had a suspicion this was not the finest crop of three-year-olds. There's probably some truth in that. Um, uh, yes. But it doesn't diminish the, the winner who did turn out to be the one among that crop who was exceptional. Yeah, it's one of these situations, Tom, which happens to me quite a lot. I don't know if it happens to you, but like after a race, you're going, I'm an absolute idiot. Like, I really am. Like, it's one of those where you go, like, I had a few quid on Bay Bridge at um, 14 to 1, just thinking, I know the ground went against it, but I was just thinking maybe he's unexposed over the trip and, you know, he's had a light enough campaign. He's only ran once since, since June. And then, like, after a race, you're going, like, what? Like, you kind of question your profession, really, to be honest with you. Because after the race, I was going, like, I'm an absolute idiot. Now, I did do the Pinsticker's Guide for Racing Post, and I did say that I couldn't have spoken more highly about or written more highly about uh, Ace Impact, but I still didn't back him, and I still didn't tip him. And for that reason, I'm an absolute idiot. Yeah, yeah. No, I, you, you did a great job in the Pinsticker's Guide. Um, and, and to be fair to you, DJ, you, you do leave yourself open in doing these things to having an egg on your face because there's no fence sitting. There's the, you you no. write off the chances of no hopers in inimitable and completely uh, unequivocal fashion. So, so fair play to you. Um, and, and you weren't a million miles away. You certainly didn't write off the chances of ace impact. Um, let's, let's turn to uh, the, the winning trainer, uh, Jean-Claude Rouget, um, his second arc, of course. Um, but he's almost as famous for coming second last year because when he did come second, um, he was in floods of tears, not because he lost, but because he was so delighted for Sir Mark Prescott, who he, he subsequently showered with, with kisses. Uh, it was a genuinely beautiful scene to be there. <laughs> I'm, glad you, I'm glad you got with kisses in there very quick. I was like, what happened to you? What? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was honestly, it was absolutely delightful. Um, what a fantastic result for him. Um, and to see him celebrate yesterday, you know, you couldn't help but be happy for, 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 for one of the game's uh, good guys, basically. Absolutely. And I kind of like his honesty. Do you know, um, he was asked after the race, kind of, you know, where does Ace Impact rate? Like, is this the best horse you've ever trained? And everybody that was interviewing him was basically looking for that explosive quote that said, this is the best horse I've ever trained. This is the best horse I've ever going to train. But he didn't. And he kind of had a small little funny dig at Aiden, I think. Um, I was trying to get the translation, but he was kind of along the lines of, you know, I know Aiden says always the next one is the best one or words to that effect. And uh, he was basically saying that, but he, he just seems he's an intriguing character. Like, I don't know him from Adam, but he's the type of fella I would absolutely love to interview because I've got so many questions. And like, I love his style. I love like he's everything I'm not because he's so laid back. He's so like, like every word means something really strongly. And uh, yeah, I, I just find him fascinating. Um, as I said, I don't know him, but I would love to meet him someday. And he's doing that in a second language as well. Fair play, Jean-Claude. Yeah, what a man. Uh, so, Ace Impact. Um, connections have said they're not committing to anything in terms of whether he stays in training, even runs again this year. Um, what do we think? What do we think, John? Do we, do, do, we obviously know <laughs> what we want to happen. As uh, Richard Forrester, our island editor, finished off his excellent report from Longchamp Encore, we want to see Ace Impact again. Do you think we will? I don't want to be the cynical one in the group that says probably not because he's immensely valuable. He was already immensely valuable before the arc. He's now twice as valuable, uh, having won over this trip for the first time. I hope that he does stay in training. I think everyone would love to see. We all come away from these races thinking what's next and everyone would love to see a, a matchup against an Equinox maybe, because this is the horse that stayed at home. Mm. And you think had Equinox turned up, given the way that through Seven Seas ran, given the way Westover ran, Equinox has given a beating to Mostar Daff, he's given a beating to really the best of Europe. Now we know who the best of Europe truly is. The idea of Ace Impact 
the equinox is very exciting. But that might just be a bit of a fantasy race that will never, ever happen. What a race it would be, though, of course. The, the only horse in the world on RPR is ahead mm. um, of Ace Impact now, uh, based on uh, the, that stunning Maidan victory early in the year, Equinox. Equinox, of course, last time out, um, had three seven Cs, fourth um, on Sunday at Longchamp, uh, a neck behind. Now, you can't just compare the two directly, but no. it, it really does sort of highlight what a, fa what a fascinating matchup that would be. Um, we do hope that the, the owners will, will, will be tempted to roll the big dice again, as John Gosden would put it, uh, and, and keep Ace Impact in training, because, by God, this would be a horse to fascinate Europe. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of money to be won as well in the early part of the season, particularly in the Middle East and around. You think his campaign could be pretty lucrative, uh, whether as lucrative as in the breeding sheds, I don't think so. And yeah. there are risks associated with that, but I'd love to see it. Maybe there's a case for mandatory, like in boxing, mandatory fights. Maybe if only we had mandatory races where they have to race each other at some point next season, that would be great. That would be great. That would be great. Uh, DJ, you're, you're famously a, uh, a cynic. Um, what do you think? Will Ace Impact stay in training? No. no. <laughs> no. Oh, sure. Wouldn't it be great? Uh, I just can't see it. Um, it's it's one of those where unbe I think the unbeaten thing is, is massive. Like There's something just purely sexy and uh, amazingly lucrative about being unbeaten. You think about Frankel... You think about Ace Impact, like it's a big deal, and he's ran six times. He's unbeaten six times. Uh, I just think they like even when you start mentioning retirement and a stud career. I think the very fact that it was mentioned very quickly suggests that it's certainly in the forefront of their minds. So, uh, as much as I would love to see Ace Impact against Equinox, I'm, I'm going to take you both. You both you pair. Is that you're the editor? Is that correct English? Both you pair. No. That's wrong. Not both. It doesn't sound I, I think it's in, inelegant as much as anything. Uh, DJ. Yeah, it yeah. is. Well, I'm going to put both of you uh, off the fence. I'm going to throw both of you off the fence, okay? Equinox, VA's impact in next year's arc, okay? The ground is the same as it was yesterday. Equinox, VA's impact. And let's, let's, ju let's just throw in. Let's throw in City of Troy, okay? City of Troy, Ace Impact, Equinox. City of Troy getting the three-year-old allowance. Who wins? I'm Love with it. Equinox. Equinox. You, you think Equinox? I think, I think Ace Impact. I think Ace Impact. Equinox isn't coming uh, around the world to, to break the Japanese duck on, uh, in those circumstances. I really don't think so. What do you think, John? I think I'd probably go Ace Impact as well. Yeah. Um, oh. Not just because you're sat here, but because <laughs> he's, he's done it, hasn't he? He's won an arc at Longchamp. Equinox travelling all that way and yeah. for the first time would potentially uh, affect those chances. I can just you can see the disappointment, the, the, the vast hordes of uh, Japanese racing fans coming over in expectation and then... They deserve yeah, one though, they, don't they? They, they really do. As, and and 3.7 seasons actually ran uh, strikingly well, running on very strongly at the death, just didn't have quite have the pace to go with them. Um, just while we're... Before we wrap up on the arc, John, um, any others we want to highlight in the, in the um, behind? We've obviously spoken about Westover, Fabulously honest uh, and reliable barometer. Um, Baybridge ran a decent race. Hookham disappointing down the field. Possibly the ground a bit too fast. Possibly, and from that draw, I mean, we did the draw analysis beforehand, and you can read a lot into the data. But the data for that stall is re is suggested he had no chance. Um, mm. I don't think he ran a bad race at all. I just think when you're having to burn that much energy to come right the way across, you're in a race that was set up for fast finishing horses, it was just not going to work for him. Um, but still had a fantastic season. I thought Continuous as well ran very well, given obviously we're looking at a St. Ledger winner trying to become the first to do it in the same season. I think he'll be really pleased with that run because it was a race that suited horses with that real class and turn of foot towards the end of their races. And for him to finish as strongly as he did off quite a slow pace, I thought was impressive. And any others from Longchamp that we want to draw attention to? Highfield Princess perhaps winning the Abbey, um, the darling of the, uh, uh, well, I was going to say of the North, but really not just the darling of the yeah, North anymore. Darling, the darling of, of, of British or European uh, sprinting. 
Um, wonderful to see from, from a very difficult draw. Yeah, exactly. And this is, a, as David Carr in his report, I think, surmised very well. This is a, a horse that's sort of defied expectations throughout her career, progressing from a handicapper to a multiple Group 1 winner over various distances. She's the type of horse everyone would love to own. Hasn't all gone right this season for one reason or another. That can happen with, with mares, with sprinters. It's just one of those things and has come up against some circumstances, some other horses, whatever. But that will all be forgotten now because she was the best horse in the race and she won like the best horse in the race, even from that draw. And DJ, last word on the weekend to you. Anything else you want to highlight? Yeah, I thought Opera Singer looked really good. Uh, daughter of Justify, as Aidan keeps saying, these Justifies, as he says, they keep growing an extra leg when they step up to a mile and trip. So uh, she looked she looked really good, I thought, yesterday. Uh, it was it was a bit of a deflating finish to the card, I thought. So Everton was set up for Kinross, Frankie's last ride in Longchamp. And then he probably gave us probably the worst ride he's ever given a horse in Longchamp which was uh, quite ironic, really. Um, you know, he should have won, and it's a pity he didn't win. Um, but it was, it was. I thought it was a really good card. Uh, four, I think, out of six group ones on the card, I think there was four winning favourites. So, uh, you know, the, the, the right horses came to the four on decent ground. It just goes to show you, when you do have an arc day with decent conditions, uh, we do get the right results, and there's not as many shocks as there is in other years when it's, bottomless so a great day was very impressed with opera singer uh the, i thought the opening winner was very good uh uh rosalian be questionable uh, unquestionable though i think is a very good colt as well and uh rosalian all roads lead to the, lead to the guineas now but a very informative day and as we said a cracking arc winner in ace impact fantastic uh, blue rose send for me another uh, highlight of the action yesterday at longchamp good to see uh, that filly bounced back uh, just before we move on to the rest of our racing news analysis this weekend, um, have a quick look at our current Members Club Ultimate offer. Welcome back. We're going to move on to our second story now, and this one's looking at a major industry story from the last seven days. Um, last week, two of these bookmaking giants made unscheduled announcements to the stock market, warning that punter-friendly results and the ongoing impact of regulation was having an impact on their revenues. First of all, Entain, owner of Ladbrokes and Coral, told the stock market this, and then later the same week, 888 owners of William Hill made a very similar announcement. Uh, stock prices of both of these huge firms ended the week sharply down, albeit having recovered slightly from the initial plunge. John, uh, the relevance of this, of course, is not only that the impact of regulation is still being felt by these bookmakers, but that it is going to have a knock-on hit to racing finances. No, absolutely. And we've spoken about it at great length on this podcast before about the, the symbiotic relationship between bookmakers and racing, which generates a great deal of its funding through bookmakers in terms of the levy, through sponsorship and all sorts of avenues. And quite naturally, if bookmakers' revenues are impacted, they may have to tighten their belts and racing could be one of the many avenues that they go down that, that could suffer as a result. In and of terms course, of things like media rights, um, which are, 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 are on turnover basis, the levy, which is on a profit basis, these can be directly hit if they're seeing. We don't yet know if, it, if it's a, a sort of racing related um, impact or, or whether it's, it's, it's focused elsewhere, but I think it's reasonable to assume, sensible to assume that um, racing is going to be part of that mix and therefore there could be a very direct sort of knock on to, to racing's finances. Yeah, I mean, that's how it would logically follow. And that relationship, racing is incredibly reliant on bookmakers. Bookmakers are partially reliant on racing, but have, of course, other revenue streams in terms of casino games, in terms of other sports. Racing is very important to bookmakers in terms of 
generating new accounts and, and generating revenue full stop. But if there is a situation where they have to consolidate, where they have to sort of rethink where they're investing their money, um, and if they're having to make cuts anywhere, then you'd think that racing would be impacted by that similarly to other areas of their businesses if they were to consolidate. And it's important to emphasise that when uh, 888 and N10 talk about regulatory pressures, they're not talking about the affordability checks which are currently being consulted on uh, by the Gambling Commission and government. Um, of course, there's been a huge amount of coverage around those proposals and what they might mean for punters and racing and bookmakers. But what we're talking about right now, the impact that bookmakers are currently feeling is existing regulation. The regulation that's already been in place, uh, that's been expanded upon and refined over recent years and has now reached a position where, of course, um, many, many uh, punters, particularly regular punters, have already been hit with affordability checks. So we, we, we ought to be clear that the hit that is currently being felt by bookmakers is separate to what may or may happen after the consultation and of course that situation could could uh, deteriorate further at that point. Yeah, very feasibly and bookmakers understandably have been getting their ducks in a row in terms of regulation. It's been a long-winded process, the gambling review, as we know better than anyone. Um, there has been a great deal of information put out there early before the white paper was even formally published so bookmakers have had a, a rough idea of what is coming um, indeed after the consultation they'll get a, a definitive answer but Entain has been as an operator has been fairly proactive in trying to get the infrastructure and things in place in terms of uh, safer gambling measures and the fact that it's already having a knock-on effect in what you'd assume is a almost a draft form or in a sort of first draft form of um, the, the measures that are going to come in, um, it could go either way, I suppose, but the suggestion would be that it, it may be even even worse. Another interesting story, I think, which sort of um, reflects where racing is right now and where the possible impact might be, uh, was a very interesting story uh, we ran last week regarding an owner who is in dispute with a bookmaker, Quinbet, um, about winnings that uh, they, 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 they earned that, that the bookmaker is declining to pay out on. Um, it's a complex story and um, it might be better if we link to the, to the, to the story in, in the description here uh, rather than go through the intricate details of it. But it caught people's imagination because effectively it, it, it sort of goes to the core of this thing about, you know, can owners who wish to get a decent bet on their horses and, and, and have that element of their engagement in the sport? Um, or are they going to be sort of, uh, you know, denied that and, and are they going to be uh, driven out of the sport as a consequence? Yeah, that's, I think that's the key take out here. You can get into the, the ins and outs of the dispute and it's gone as far as IBAS, the dispute service. It's poten potentially going to go even further than that, a suggestion of it might be a matter that would need to be resolved through the courts. So it's it's a complicated, unique case, but it speaks to this larger issue of how owners engage with the sport. And one of those ways, that, or one of the ways that they engage with the sport in a, in a significant way is through betting on their own horses. That, for a lot of owners, will be a massive part of the enjoyment. Suddenly, if you take the ability to back your own horse out of the game, that's a fairly significant chunk of the ownership experience, which we all know is the reason people spend thousands and thousands of pounds. It's certainly not to make money, it's to experience racehorse ownership. Um, so it's concerning and, and I think it's something that we've had t um, anecdotally from owners relating to affordability checks as well, in that um, there are concerns that if they weren't able to bet on their own horses, that might significantly diminish their interest in the sport. And DJ, while we're on the thorny subject of regulation, give us an update on the Irish Gambling Bill. Of course, this, this currently progressing through the parliamentary system over there and potentially resulting in uh, sweeping restri restrictions to advertising on TV, which uh, we've had warnings could make the broadcast of Irish racing unsustainable. What's the latest on that? But the latest seems to be, Tom, that it's it's the, the vibes I'm getting are that it's been accepted that this legislation with regard to the to the ban on gambling advertising between those hours is not going to be changed. 
that there's been meetings with uh, government members, uh, meetings with the minister, and it seems to be that it's now a foregone conclusion that this legis- legislation will be as we are reading it at the moment. Uh, it's not going to be changed. So HRI are now trying to come up with, with solutions. Uh, I ran a piece with Suzanne Ede, who's chief, chief, chief executive of Force Racing Ireland uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, basically, she said, look, we're trying to come up with solutions but Irish racing not being shown on Irish television screens is not an option. So we will find solutions. But she hasn't actually said what these solutions are. And we don't know what these solutions are. And uh, obviously the negotiation process is underway at the moment, trying to find out an alternative way of, of, of covering the cost, I suppose, of uh, the loss of funding from gambling advertising on uh, Racing TV and uh, Sky Sports Racing. Um, that's where we are at the moment. So I think we can take it as a given that gambling advertising will not be on racing TV uh, f- from whenever next year or potentially the year after. And as they said, it's not financially viable for, for racing TV to continue under those circumstances. So we have to find something to fill that hole. So I presume that's what HRI are doing at the moment because the, the catastrophic consequences for owners here are like, it's just, it's scary to think that we could have a race, just say there's racing in Fairy House today. We could have a race in Fairy House today where an owner is working and, you know, they're pumping all their, a, a good degree of their um, uh, recreational spend into owning this racehorse. They're working today. They could be an accountant. They could be a teacher. They could be anything. They're working today. They want to watch their horse running. They want to maybe record it on Sky or something and watch it when they come home from work. And they can't. And like the, uh, like it's just the, the effects of that are, are, are absolutely massive, so they are. So I know, as Willie Mullins said, he thinks, Willie Mullins thinks it's going to drive people to open more accounts because you can obviously watch a race. If you have a betting account and you have a bet in a race, you can watch a race and you can stream it. And he thinks that's the effect it's going to have by racing not being on racing TV. But I still think the owner, the owner's body in this country are extremely worried about the consequences it's going to have on owners and the potential fall. And uh, yeah, hopefully these solutions can be found, Tom, but I, I just don't know what they are at the moment. Yeah, so absolutely extraordinary situation to, uh, to, to, to develop. I mean, a, 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 just an exceptional act of self-sabotage by the Irish government in terms of potentially damaging uh, such a successful sport uh, for the country and a huge export industry as well. Um, not the most um, confidence-inspiring statement by Suzanne Eid that there will be solutions, but we just don't know what they are yet. Yeah, absolutely. Well, she was like, in fairness, like she's 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 a good speaker, and she's you know she's she like w- when she talks, you listen. And I thought even on the media rights issue where there was a breakaway group, and I thought she spoke really well. And and you know we don't hear for from her every day of the week or every week of the year, but when she does talk, she does speak quite well. And and I did think I was surprised when I when I spoke to her that she was so she was so pro this thing on television and this is going to happen and we are going to make this happen and Irish racing not being on racing TV is is simply not an option. Now, it's one thing saying that, it's another thing actually doing it. So the doing part is obviously going to be extremely interesting. I have no idea what negotiations are going on behind the scenes, but those negotiations are going to have to go well and they're going to have to be pretty rapid because we're going to need a solution here sooner rather than later. We can't have this uncertainty hanging over us for the next couple of months wondering, oh God, in 2024, is there not going to be Irish racing on television? Because it's a it's a serious product, there's serious money involved. And when the next media rights package comes along in 2028, um, we're trying to negotiate a deal. And this deal is hugely important for race courses and everybody involved in the industry. Like if if Irish racing is not on racing TV. It's going to seriously diminish that product. So it's going to be a big couple of months, Tom. It, it, you, you'd assume, thinking about it logically, that one of the ways that you could address that kind of thing is by you know, doing what they used to do with British racing on, on Channel 4 and effectively subsidising its broadcast. But then that's going to have an impact 
to prize money. Who knows, there may well be other solutions. I guess another point worth considering there is that while Irish Racing is of course on uh, Racing TV, uh, and it's a subscription channel so it does have other revenue lines, um, British Racing of course broadcasts into Ireland on Sky Sports Racing which is entirely advertising funded. So what is the future of that? Because a situation where Irish racing fans can no longer watch a huge swathe of British racing is pretty extraordinary as well. Yeah, I actually spoke to uh, somebody in Sky Sports, not Sky Sports Racing, but actually Sky Sports, because I was thinking to myself, if this gambling ban does come in in Ireland, could it affect you know, Liverpool and Tottenham on Saturday evening? Could it affect... Uh, you know, the viability of the Sky Sports channels as well. But he didn't seem to think that it would have an effect on that side. Because you could imagine here in Ireland, imagine if you were told that your 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 Premier League fixtures were going to be in jeopardy because of this ban. It doesn't look like it's going to be as severe as that. But for racing, for racing, it's, 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 it's I don't know, there are no words to describe the consequences that this could have. And you only hope, obviously, there is the option of subscriptions going skyrocketing up and you know but for a lot of people like racing tv is quite expensive and if they do up the subscription like you're going to have a, a huge percentage of people dropping off and not paying for the subscription because it's probably a, there's a lot of arguments in a lot of households at the moment saying your bill comes in every month we're paying this for sky and oh what's this on top of oh it's it's racing tv on top of the sky's package and so you've got sky sports you've got your racing tv and whatever if you want your movies and everything so you're talking i know at the moment my site sky subscription for sky sports with racing tv and everything on top of it like it's in around 160 quid and 160 quid a month like it's, it's pretty expensive so if they're putting that up again it's going to be obviously more expensive so there's going to be big decisions for households if that subscription is pushed up and hopefully it doesn't come to that but um it's just, oh, look, it's really worrying, Tom. Yeah, well, last, last thing on this, DJ, is, you know, we've, we've obviously covered at length the woes of, of British racing, British bookmaking in terms of, uh, you know, the sort of increasingly tough regulatory environment. But one thing that has been sort of clarified from the beginning, even, um, you know, uh, to the extent it's been a, in a sort of a, a statement made by anti-gambling advertising campaigners, is that racing should get a carve-out. We've seen this repeatedly from politicians um, who have advocated such a step. Now obviously uh, the, it turns out regulation is not even going down that route uh, over here, but it's kind of extraordinary that in Ireland, which has such a strong racing industry, um, it is by sort of proportion a much more significant part of the economy, it's a bigger sport uh, in terms of public interest. It's kind of extraordinary that they have not been able to secure a similar carve out. You know, is it is it fair to say that Irish racing has dropped the ball on this one? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a valid point, and it's it's hard to know when, when when you actually explain it in the way that you've done, and you see the benefit to the economy. It is a head scratcher, and you're kind of saying to yourself, is it something that you know should have been looked at and should have been done earlier? And and there's so many things when when something like this comes along, you always look at things that have happened over the years and changes that could have been made and you know differences that could have been made to the industry because as you said like you're talking about like I often think when when you think of Aidan O'Brien you think of Willie Mullins you think of how big they are in in the sport in the world never mind just in Ireland and we have world leaders in the industry here you go down to Bally Doyle and you have you know rural employment which is in in any government in anywhere in the world rural employment is massive and here you've got an operation that's employing hundreds of people and it could be jeopardized by something like this so sir there, there have been mistakes made over the years tom there had been there could have been changes which could and possibly should have been made and i i think i don't know what you think and especially in britain and in ireland as well like 2024 is just going to be a massive year for the industry isn't it like like we're, we're into october now and a lot is going to happen probably between now and Christmas, between Britain and Ireland in the various challenges that we're facing. But I think next year we're actually going to see how the impact, how the sport is going to be impacted by all these changes. I think it's going to be a colossal 12 months. I don't know what you think. 
No, DJ, I absolutely agree. There's a lot of challenges facing the sport right now, both internal and regulatory. Um, 2024 has the potential to be a truly seismic year for racing. Um, we're going to leave that subject there. Just before we finish the show, though, we're going to rattle through a few uh, quick-fire topics that we thought ought to be covered in some respect. John, I'm going to start with you. Um, we're still awaiting the fixture list in Britain. Normally, it'll be out by now. Um, what's happening? Yeah, so still waiting on the fixture list, which is going to include some what you might call radical uh, differences from previous years in the premierisation, yeah, premier fixtures, introduction of premier yeah. fixtures, um, and and various other initiatives. I think that is probably the reason for the delay, because it still needs to be signed off by the levy board. As far as we know, this is as of sort of last week. We were expecting it in the coming weeks, so perhaps this week, perhaps next. I'm slightly guessing there, but it's imminent. Um, it required sign-off from the levy board um, simply because I think there was a question of how a lot of these new initiatives were going to be funded. Um, more the suggestion being that some of the money is going to come from smaller fixtures as well. Yes, that was the, that's what suggested and on a sort of understood basis one of the sticking points was yeah. the funding of these premier fixtures. I think you kind of flip it and look at the consequences of not having a fixture list. There's a lot of trainers and owners. I was speaking to the Kublers yesterday. There's a lot of trainers and owners who are going to be spending a lot of money in the coming weeks at Tattersall's who don't yet know the, the defined shape of the fixture list next year. You have mm. a rough idea because it's been very well documented to this point. But until you have that piece of paper in front of you, it's hard to plan your business um, and your investments. Um, so it will be interesting to see what the, the final shape that that takes um, when we eventually see it. Should be soon, should be soon. Uh, DJ, over to you. Um, we had something which happens um, inconceivably often in racing. Um, happened this week, in fact, it happened in, in Greyhounds, first of all, and then it happened in racing. The wrong <laughs> horse ran in a race at Killarney a few days after the wrong dog ran in a race at Swindon. How does this happen? Yeah, the, I suppose the, the Swindon winner was a little more emphatic than <laughs> than uh, than the the wrong heart horse fiasco at Killarney. Look, this is this is just like it's we we spoke about how twenty twenty four is going to be a massive year for the industry. Like for something like this to happen in twenty twenty three, and it's a simple error. So this is where I stand with this. So basically, to sum up, for people that don't know, uh, the trainer uh, Johnny Fien had two horses that were due to run in Killarney on Saturday. And Indigo 5 ran instead of Anno Mana, and Indigo 5 won the race, but was not um, the three-year-old filly, Anno Mana, so was subsequently disqualified 20 minutes or so after the race. Now, the problem I have here, and I don't know if you if both of you share the same uh, opinion on this, but what happens is, I think this is what happens anyway, when a horse... Uh, arrives at a race course, it's checked and the tag is checked and everything to uh, to work out the identity of the horse to make sure it's the right horse that's arrived, okay? So then, under rule 226, uh, the stewards then basically disqualify the horse because the horse could not be identified as Anomana and was in fact Indigo 5, which is due to run later. So the trainer got fined and that's fine, okay? And this happened back in Galway uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2021, when Alizarine ran uh, in a maiden and uh, was supposed to run, it was Aurora Princess, an older horse that ran in the maiden as well. And, and, and the, I suppose the, the, the thing to mention here is, in both circumstances, both horses looked extremely like each other, okay? So it's an easy mistake to make, in my opinion. Others will argue, no, it's not. The people involved in the stable should know the individual horse, and maybe they should. But is there no check that can be done when horses are entering the parade ring, okay? So the only check you'll have to make here, I think, and I could be wrong here, is, if a trainer has multiple runners on the card. So you could have, at a meeting at Killarney, I'm sure there was a, a lot of trainers that were only represented by one horse. So you'd only have to do it with horses or trainers with multiple runners on the card. So Johnny Feen in those circumstances, okay, Johnny Feen has two runners on the card. Before his horse enters the parade ring, for the race in question here, let's do the check and find out if this is the right horse that's running. Now, it is potentially could take up a little bit of time, but in order for something like this to happen now twice in the space of two years, we need to be, it, it's a little bit like weighing in, the weighing in procedure. Like this needs to be right. This needs to be 100% right all the time. It, we cannot factor in human error 
in these circumstances. This is something that's as simple as the right horse running in the right race. We should be able to determine that. It should be ABC stuff. It should be somebody in junior infants should be able to decide that a horse can run in the race and it's the right horse. It's inexplicable that in 2023, this sort of nonsense is still happening. So for that reason, I think we, sh we should have some sort of check when the horses are entering the parade ring before a race. If it is time consuming, so be it. They enter the parade ring a little bit earlier. I think it's surely something that can be done. I don't know, it couldn't take up that much time, could it? I think they could surely fix it, DJ. And I, I like the fact you started that quite calm and by the end of it, had whipped yourself into, yeah. <laughs> into it's like Rory McIlroy. The, on the ineptitude of it, absolutely. I mean, listen, it, it, mistakes do happen, but surely it's not beyond the wit of racing to come up with a solution to prevent this. Microchips are there; they can be checked. And um, just before we wrap up, finally, um, I felt a little nip in the ear this morning, um, a sure sign that the, the jumps are coming back, as was the return of uh, one of the most enigmatic and fascinating characters, Envoy Len. Uh, DJ, what did you make of it? Uh, Midland, Midland would be the word I'd use. Uh, he, he's a horse that is, for a horse that's won at three Cheltenham festivals, and I think going into the race on Saturday, I think he'd won 15 of his 22 races. He's getting towards a million in prize money, and he's achieved a hell of a lot in his career, but, um, at the moment, he's one of these horses that people are like, oh, God, Envoy Allen, you can't trust him. And he's a has-been and, you know, he's he's hot and cold. And he and, and to be honest, people with that opinion, um, like it was basically a typical Envoy Allen performance on Saturday. He's won first time out for every season so far. This was the first time he hasn't won first time out. I thought turned into the home straight he was getting into it and then he got a little bit tired. He's going to probably defend his crown in the Labrox Champion Chase at Down Royal um, in early November. That will tell us a good bit more about Envoy Allen. But he is one of these horses. He's an enigma. For all that he's won and for all the Ch Cheltenham festivals that he's been successful at, he will probably still go into the history books as a disappointing horse, which is hard to believe given how many grade ones he's won. But I think we just expected so much from him. We expected him to be the next big deal. We expected him to be what Gallop in the Champs is now, and he just hasn't produced it. So uh, it's going to be interesting. Farinilli runs in Galway tomorrow, bought by J.P. Manis from Paul Byrne, uh, grade one winner at the Punchdown Festival. So these horses are gradually starting to come out, Tom. And for Jumps fans, this is a tremendously exciting time of year. Yeah, it certainly is. We spoke earlier about whether Ace Impact would uh, stay in training. We hope he does, but the beauty of the jumps is that these familiar horses with all their idiosyncrasies, uh, foibles and in skills in many cases are coming back out to fascinate us once again. If uh, you're looking to open a new betting account to uh, take advantage of some of the offers um, in advance of the jump season, do check out our free bets page uh, advert for it coming up right now. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we are almost at the end of our show, but it merely remains to decide what goes on the front page. John, is this the biggest certainty of all time? I would say so, and unless I've got it wrong and you're about to. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would put the arc on the front page. Any dissent, DJ? No, and, and on the subject of front pages, Two beautiful front pages, I have to say this. Sunday's front page in the Racing Post, I obviously work for Racing Post, so this is a shameless plug, but Sunday was probably my favourite front page of the whole year in the Racing Post. So uh, Ace Impact is going to go on the front page three days in a row, I think it is, Tom, now. Excellent. Well, well, well said, DJ. A big shout out to the, uh, the graphics team at the Racing Post who put together that beautiful Casablanca-inspired front page. Uh, for Sunday's edition. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a great show. Thanks also to John and DJ for all of their input. Please do join us again next week for more discussion of the biggest stories in racing. But until then, goodbye.